Israel is facing the equivalent of a constitutional crisis after a ruling by the nation's high court. Yesterday, the Israeli Supreme Court narrowly struck down part of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's controversial judicial overhaul plan. The law in question had placed severe limitations on the Supreme Court's oversight of the government. The law passed last summer after months of massive protests. Netanyahu spoke to CNN's Wolf Blitzer back in July about this exact scenario. If the court does strike this down, will you abide by that ruling? What you're talking about is a situation, a potential situation, uh, where in American terms, the United States Supreme Court would take a constitutional amendment and say that it's unconstitutional. That's the kind of, uh, uh, the, the kind of spiral that you're talking about, and I hope we don't get to that. Joining us now is Mark Regev, senior advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and former Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom. Mark Regev, I just want to start with what we just heard. Um, Netanyahu saying that he hoped it wouldn't come to this. Now that you are here, uh, does he plan to respond to this and abide by this ruling? So, so far, we haven't had a, a, a public comment from the prime minister. I think he's waiting for the right time uh, to comment about this decision. As you said, it was eight justices against seven. It was a narrow decision, and it reflects, I think, there is a, a serious debate in Israeli society about this issue. But I can tell you what there is no debate about, and that is that this issue needs to be put aside, and we have to now focus on winning this war against Hamas, because the the, the, the debate about judicial reform is a divisive factor, and, and this is not a time for, uh, for divisive political issues. This is a time to focus on what needs to be done, dealing with this ex existential threat to Israel, uh, Hamas. We have to end this uh, terror enclave on our southern mm -hmm. border. Uh, you know, a member of Netanyahu's party, the former diplomacy, a former diplomacy minister, issued an apology over her role in this judicial overhaul bill. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because she connects it to the October 7th attacks. She says, quote, I was one of those people that caused the state to be weakened, that harmed people. I created a split, I created a rift, and I created tension. And this tension brought weakness, and this weakness, in many ways, brought massacre. Um, can, can you talk a, about this apology and whether you think it is time for this administration to start addressing these concerns? So it's clear that during the very, very uh, 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 forceful, uh, vibrant uh, polemics on both sides of the issue, uh, things were said that would have better not have been said. And I think uh, uh, the, d the debate was at times overly passionate. And, and one of the things that I think we learned on October 7th is that when Hamas stormed the border and they started massacring our people, they didn't ask us uh, what is our position on judicial reform. They didn't ask us if we like or don't like the prime minister. They didn't ask us if we were left of center or right of center. They, they, they killed everyone randomly. And, and today fighting in Gaza, in the same tank, you'll have people who, who, who like the prime minister and who don't like the prime minister. You'll have people who support judicial reform and people who oppose judicial reform. But I think uh, uh, September 7th, sorry, October 7th showed us that we are facing external threats that really uh, uh, cast a shadow over any sort of internal debate over judicial reform. There'll be a right time in the future once this war is over, to go back and discuss the ins and outs of judicial reform. But at the moment, crucial that we focus on winning this war against Hamas. But do you think that Netanyahu has the public support he needs to pursue this conflict to its end? Meaning there have been concerns, protests about his focus on the hostages. There is this judicial issue, which people do see as part of the existential conversation about government checks and balances and policy in Israel and policy that is uh, affecting Gaza. So do you think that support will continue um, so that he can, as you said, finish this war. So it's, it's actually very interesting because the, the goals that Netanyahu has articulated, the destruction of Hamas's military machine, the end of its rule in Gaza, bringing back all the hostages home, those goals are, are supported widely in Israel, across the political spectrum, from, from the left through to the right. On these issues, there is a strong national consensus in Israel. And in fact, the government, since October 7th, has been expanded. One of the major center parties that was previously in opposition moved into the government because they wanted a broader coalition 
that was needed to fight this war. But that now, doesn't mean they again, haven't been have without the... criticism, correct? And certainly the hostages family have become a potent political force in Israel because it's not the goal, it's the path to it, and whether they think Netanyahu is accomplishing that. 100% in Israel, um, we're a free country and people speak their minds. And of course, when one talks about the hostage families, of course, we listen to them because uh, we can only sort of start to understand the pain that go they're going through. Think about this for a moment. It's, it's 80 plus days. Their loved ones have been in Gaza, held by Hamas. And, and we all know what sort of brutality, what horrific brutality Hamas is capable of. And added to that, the first group of hostages that were released uh, after 50 some days in November, the, what we hear from them, I mean, I heard the chief psychiatrist of the children's hospital that was treating the children who came back, you know, there were two year olds, four year olds, six year olds, nine year olds that were taken hostage by Hamas, that she talked about. This psychologist said they were forced to take psychiatric drugs. They were forced to watch their mothers being sexually abused by, by Hamas terrorists. Uh, they, they were forced to watch video of, of the Hamas massacre and of people being killed and beheaded and so forth. So, of course, one has to em have empathy and support the hostage families. They are going through living hell. But to give an example of some, of some frustrations, there's been some reporting that Hamas sent Israel a hostage proposal on Sunday. It was rejected. Why? So, so, I mean, there's a lot of reporting out there that is obviously disinformation. I can assure you, and I know for a fact, that if there's a serious opportunity to release hostages, it will be taken. Uh, the government won't let it uh, stand, uh, go away. Are there uh, specific terms you're November. looking for in order to accept? Well, I, I can't negotiate here with you on CNN, I apologize, but we, we did it in November. We can do it in January, but one thing has to be clear. Hamas isn't going to suddenly release hostages because they've become humanitarians. Yes, these are brutal, bloody, extreme terrorists. They will only release the hostages if they're under pressure. As Joe Biden said, your president, that Hamas only understands pressure. And we're applying that pressure now. The Israeli military campaign is applying pressure on Hamas. That very same pressure can expedite, we believe, the release of hostages. Mark Regev, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me.